Hello everybody, welcome back to class and we are now going into unit two and we are going to be looking at spreadsheets and how they're used in, in data science. And you know, I, I have like been doing some tweaks here to the course shell as you can see in the background, still in, in progress by the way, uh, basically converting the course shell to my, my style. <laughs> um, but I always put the topic list at the top and I do plan on kind of going through all these topics here tonight. And first of all, we're going to start with this thing. What is a spreadsheet? And if I was just to kind of generically throw this question out there, what would some of you say? And, and feel free to speak up if you, if you want to. What, how, if you talk to somebody who's like, I don't know what a spreadsheet is, how would you explain it to them? Anybody want to volunteer? Um, <clears throat> I would say it's an organized data table. Okay. With different uh, headers and columns, rows, all that fun stuff. Okay, uh, th that's not a bad way to look at it. Um, it, 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 is a, it is an interesting data structure, isn't it? Because, you know, when people first started developing software for computers, you know, very quickly they realized it would be great if we could take what we would do in a document tool like Microsoft Word. So I'm just going to bring Word up on, on the screen here really quick to kind of just kind of talk about, I suppose, history of this and how it developed. Um, but when they started creating... Uh, computer applications, even for command line interfaces, one of the first like major pieces of software that was developed was a word processor. And it, even though we did it from a command line, so like when I started working in IT, for example, uh, our IT department, this wasn't that long ago even, uh, we were using, we weren't using Windows as an operating system, we were using DOS, and the word processor we used was WordPerfect. And we also used another piece of software that was really important too, called Lotus One Two Three, which is one of the first big, um, you know, uh, spreadsheet software packages that became popular. Not not the first though, by the way. In fact, the first spreadsheet software I think that became popular was called VisiCalc, and only people who computed back in the '80s on, you know, like green screen consoles basically would even know what I'm talking about. Um, but you know. Word processors were developed first, and you know the, the point was that you could type up a document and edit it and copy paste and do all the things that we're used to. Maybe even highlight segments of text and make them bold or italic, and put in a heading and a citation and those things, and then ultimately be able to push it out to a, a document printer, or or save the file and, and transmit it to somebody. Uh, the next kind of major piece of software they, they came up with was, was a, a spreadsheet. And, you know, I'm going to go to, to Google here, and I'm just going to see if I can type uh, VisiCalc here and see if we can find any images of it. Here we go. This is, these are great images. So it kind of shows you where spreadsheets uh, started and what they look like. So when I first, uh, and, you know, and this is kind of how I experienced it. It was on a machine just like that when my first real computer was an Apple IIe, not too dissimilar from this one. Although I had two five and a half inch floppy drives, not one, um, and, a, and a whopping 64K of RAM. And here's the irony of it. I still have that system and it still boots. And I have it in a box and it's probably, I should probably put it on eBay and sell it as a collector's piece at this point. Um, but you know, when I, when I was presented with a computer system, you know, it came with all the software and all of it was on diskette, right? So you would use one disk drive to boot your computer and then you would put your other disk, your program disk in the other drive to launch your program. So VisiCalc was on a disk and we're like, oh, what is this? So I launched it and to see what it is. And I looked at it and quickly didn't understand and moved on and never touched it again. But then when I later on in life learned what a spreadsheet was, I started to think about it. I'm like, hold on a second. These people had designed this concept. I don't know when it was, probably back in the you know um, late 70s or early 80s, probably right, right around that time. But what, what, it, what the product brings to you, you can see this screenshot here I think was, is, a, is a good one, is it does create basically a document. It still is a document. And, and, and frankly, ultimately, really it is a text file but it's, it's a structured document. It's a document that has an organization of column and rows, or a table, if you will. And in some cases, uh, you can have multiple tables in, within one document, and Excel does allow us to do that. But what it was used for was its ability to basically be able to type in text or numbers and have them neatly organized in rows and columns, and then more importantly, to be able to add formulas to columns to calculate the contents 
you know, for example, like summing a column of numbers. And, and that, that was revolutionary at the time, absolutely revolutionary. And when they started to kind of marry the concepts of formula building with the thoughts of computer programming, we got to more and more complicated spreadsheet tools and and spreadsheets are so powerful you know and, and I will argue that you know if you look at the Microsoft Office suite for as powerful as Microsoft Word is Excel you know laps it like a thousand times in, in terms of its capability and power you know it really is in my mind the most important part of the Microsoft Office suite hands down and and perhaps one of the the best software packages ever developed you know and that's a pretty bold statement but I stand by that because I've I've utilized it in such high levels that uh, I can't imagine what tools I would use in, in replacement of it all right so VisiCalc is where it started uh, and then Excel you know I don't know exactly when it was released you can probably Google that and, and, and figure it out um, but I think it's interesting to see where people were starting with these concepts and that even though we had non-graphical operating systems, people still had spreadsheets. And you know what? They're still, they were still pretty visual. Uh, a fascinating story I love to tell, too, is, you know, VisiCalc didn't really stick around for long. And, and I don't know the exact product history of it, but it'd probably be a fascinating study, I'm sure. Um, VisiCalc kind of quickly gave way to a product called Lotus 123. And Lotus 123 was kind of the Excel of its day. In the 80s and going well into the 90s, early 90s, mid 90s, uh, Lotus 123 was really kind of the spreadsheet tool of choice um, by most professionals. I happened to work with um, a dean at my school way back then um, who had come out of an engineering background. And he worked at Alice Chalmers, if you guys remember that company, they were up in West Dallas. They were the biggest tractor manufacturer on the planet back in the you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, but they folded over time. Uh, but being on the engineering team there, he used Lotus 123 for everything, including writing his documents. <laughs> so if he would type you a letter, he would type it up in Lotus 123. I'm like, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> you know, so I eventually had to tell him, you know, there's Microsoft Word, <laughs> you can use that instead. Um, but it shows you that, you know, that really you can use it in some capacities beyond just like number crunching. You can use it to do like, for example, uh, beautiful formatted documents that print out beautifully because other products it's much harder to control like rows and columns and layouts and borders and spacing and things. And, and so you can use it almost as a desktop publishing tool as, lo as well as a uh, data processing environment. Um, the other thing that, um, you know, I, I bring here, you know, is um, what other software might we possibly use? And, and for, first of all, I, I do want to point out that with Office 365, and all of you, of course, have an Office 365 account uh, attached um, to your Gateway account. And, and most of you most likely came here to download Excel and use it, right? So if you log in to office.com, and if you have not done this by the way, um, you should. Okay, so Gateway offers to all of its students uh, free Office 365. You can simply go to office.com, uh, register with your Gateway email address, and you will have relatively instant access. Many of you might be using Excel attached to a personal account. So in other words, you might have your own copy that you purchased, and that, that's fine, but I do want to make you aware that Gateway offers it to you for free as well. And once you get in and you know registered and logged into office.com with your gateway account, you will have the option right here from the main screen to install Office. And here's the beauty of it. You can install it on up to five machines with this credential. You know, so um, if you're paying personally for, for Office and some people do subscribe or, or purchase outright, um, I, I just want to let you know this is free. There's no, no cost involved. The other thing I will point out is there is a browser-based version of Excel as well. And if you go in here and uh, start to poke around a little bit, you'll notice that, you know, hey, this is really, really close to the installed version. However, and this is a big however, we can do some of the basic work in here. But when we get to upper level activities, um, this one kind of will fall short. You know, so this is 
probably fine for 95% of people's Excel needs. You know, basic formulas, uh, formatting, pivot tables, charts, graphs, you can do all that stuff in here. Um, but ultimately, the installed version is significantly more powerful. And I would implore you as you're taking this class to prefer to use the installed version always. You know, I, at times, you know, if I'm in a pinch, you know, for example, I have uh, an old Mac computer sitting to my left here, and it's pretty old. It's like verging on 10, 12 years old now. And I discovered that Microsoft Office, the installed version, was slowing it down significantly, and then I opted, you know what, I don't need Office on here. If I really want to use Office on here, I'll just go through the browser. And boy, that made a huge difference. Um, but it is available in a pinch, right? So you can open it up through any web browser interface you can heck you can open it up on your phone um, and get to an Excel spreadsheet and do some work or look at some numbers or type in a basic formula but I would consider that more of a backup than anything else you will need the installed version for this class but I think it's important for you to know just in case you don't that it is available in the browser a lot of us come now from especially you know the younger people in the session here come from you know academic backgrounds in high school where they they very heavily push the Google products you know so they they push us into you know Google Drive Google Docs Google Sheets Google Slides and there's nothing wrong with those products we use them very heavily here at Gateway but you have that same capability here with Microsoft Office and just like Google Docs you have capabilities when you use the Office 365 version whether it's installed or in browser, and you're logged into your gateway account version to do many of the same things that you can do with Google Docs, including live editing the same document or sharing the document with other people in your organization, etc. And a lot of people aren't aware of that. And it always floors me here at Gateway that people who are even <laughs> pretty technologically savvy are not aware of that fact so I think that's really important to know but there is that browser based version and I think um, you should explore it and play with it uh, at least a little bit the other thing that happens is if you are doing work in here and all of a sudden you reach a limitation right so like oh my god I can't do that here this doesn't even have that tool available and that will happen uh, you have the capability and I think this is the button you you press and maybe maybe it's not but you can actually there's a there's an interface in here somewhere where it allows you to switch to the installed version. So it'll take whatever's in your browser, push it into your installed Excel, and you continue your work. It's right next to the editing button. Oh, yeah, you know what? So Sometimes it's so obvious that I don't even see it. <laughs> but but thank you, Anthony. The, the, the problem is uh, too close to your face or too in front of your face, I think, is the, the same. It, it is. And you know what? I, I, I tend to be, like, as I'm lecturing here, looking at you guys uh, and your reactions more than <laughs> than necessarily, like, what I'm, I'm seeing on the screen. But, yeah, it is, it is right here on the screen. Thank you, uh, class, for pointing out what is so evidently obvious. Um, all right. Let, let me uh, take us back to... Uh, uh, this interface though and, and and I come back to this interface and I know we talked about it last time a little bit but the the fact that we have access to office 365 also gives us access to a number of other things through this same interface by the way um, which are some of the higher level tools we will explore later on in this program you know so if you guys are really super into figuring this stuff out and plowing forward hey please do um, but if you look down here, you know, this, these app icons that they have, and you come down here to all apps, and they, they have this, like, list, and you start to look at some of these, and you guys might be aware of many of these already and, and have tried them. But if you're like me, who's been a Microsoft user for a long time, uh, when I first came in here, I was kind of floored. It's like, what the heck is Sway? Or, and, and what the heck is Power BI? And what the heck is Lists? And you know, all these different tools here. Uh, and if you actually dig down further, there's even more. Um, and all of these are available to us. So later on in the program, you will be working with Power BI. That's going to be one of the tools we work with. And they do have a browser-based version, once again, and an installed version. Uh, we also will work with lists in some capacity, which is basically, um, I guess I'll call it a offshoot of SharePoint. And, and I'm seeing that they don't have SharePoint listed here anymore if they do no they still have SharePoint but SharePoint is this bizarre product that uh, we used to teach here at Gateway 
and one of its fundamental data structures was basically tabular information, and this is what spreadsheets are, in the form of what they would call lists. And lists pretty much drove the whole platform. So it was basically like a fancy uh, database slash flat file combo thing uh, with a web interface and you know interoperability with OneDrive and a bunch of other Microsoft applications built in. So for example, if you worked in SharePoint, you could add a live editable uh, Excel spreadsheet right to your SharePoint web page where you could share it with people within your organization and they could either just view it or go, go in and live edit it without ever leaving their browser interface. And then all that data can be pushed to wherever you want. To take it even further, they have some new products in here that kind of piggyback off that. So um, we have, you know, basically the SharePoint core, which led to lists, and then lists drive the data that allow us to do things like Dynamics 365, Power Apps, Power Automate, and a couple of other new tools, which ultimately uh, can be pushed into Power BI and then visualized on a very high level. So, like, for example, uh, when you guys go out to the web these days and you look at COVID-19 data and you see people will have like geographical maps where the data is plotted and they have like circles or colors that show how bad the, the virus is. A lot of that is generated automatically through products like Power BI and the stream of these few applications I just mentioned. Most of the data though, in its origin, typically at some point along the pathway will have come through Excel. And this, this is really, you know, why, why do we start with Excel? Because Excel is really kind of the first level. It, it can do more than most of these apps anyhow, um, with the exception of maybe Power BI. Um, but Excel has the capability of reading in data from just about any format, uh, sanitizing it, cleaning it, preparing it for uh, different levels of analysis. And that, that's why we start with that tool. So this, this is where you find it, this is where you install it, and we already all have it installed, which is great, but in you know future semesters, somebody might watch this video and say, hey, you know, I don't have it installed, where do I get it? Well, here it is. Okay, so the install option, once again, is available on the main screen after you log in. Um, you just follow uh, the prompt uh, to do it. Um, the installer, by the way, for those of you that maybe just installed it, I think uh, works beautifully these days. You know, and I think back to the days when um, I was uh, first I installing, um, you know, Microsoft Office. I, I worked in a support role at a university, and we would be tasked with the, "Hey, you got to install, you got to install Microsoft Office on these, you know, 200 laptops or whatever." And you know, the process of, of doing that, where uh, initially we had Office on diskette, if you can imagine, and it was came in a box with like 20 disks, and we'd sit there and have to feed. These you know 1.44 megabyte diskettes you know over and over into these machines in the process, uh, and then later on it came on CD, and then later on we figured out how to push it over the network and all those things. Um, but it was time consuming, and now it's like you jump in here, you get the installer going, within minutes you're you're kind of up and running with some of the basic apps, uh, and then a lot of the components that are missing will auto install once you first use them. By the way, that's what the strategy is. All right, so beyond that. You notice I, I've taken us into the Google Drive platform now, and the reason I'm doing this is, you know, I will invariably, and I haven't heard it from you guys yet, but somebody will say, well, like, hey, Ty, can I use Google Sheets to do this? I don't want to install Microsoft Excel, right? And I, I, I'll give you this g generic answer, no. <laughs> and, and not that it's a bad product. It is getting better all the time, but it is not Excel. I mean, it's kind of like comparing like, um, you know, a half million dollar race car to, you know, uh, a Chevy Impala, you know, they're not in the same category. I'm just sorry, they're not, you know, it's not the same thing. Uh, but, and I'm going to say this uh, carefully here, it is still a good tool. And so if you're coming into Google Sheets, which is their spreadsheet product through the, the Google Drive interface, you'll notice that you have the ability to directly create a spreadsheet. I'm just going to go ahead and do that. Whenever you're any any of the Google apps, by the way, and you have the what we call the waffle icon, that's what Google calls it, uh, where the apps are located, you can actually go directly to Sheets. So you can just jump into that directly. And I want to show you the different interface that you get when you do. 
Uh, and so, like, if you have certain things that you'd like to pre-create, you know, um, you can just come in here and, and click on, you know, one of the predetermined formats and choose it and then alter it to your heart's content. Or you can just create something blank and build your own. Through the Google Docs interface you guys saw uh, just a moment ago, you just go directly into a blank spreadsheet. Of course, the beauty of working in this online environment with a Google spreadsheet is that it instantaneously auto saves no matter what you do. So, like every couple, you know, if I type something in, watch you know watch the address bar above, it's already saved. <laughs> every change is auto saved. Okay, so let, let's talk about that with Excel. That's not automatic in Excel. Okay. In Microsoft Word, interestingly, it is. But in Excel, autosave is a conscious thought to turn on. And then, turn on that. The word is only autosave when you are using OneDrive. So that's something I wanted to ask you about. Do you use OneDrive? You know, uh, Anthony, that's a wonderful question. Yes, I do. Although, um, recently, uh, with uh, one of the latest uh, major updates of Windows 10, and maybe this is what you're referring to, Microsoft very quietly took all of our personal documents, desktops, downloads, you know, all our, our common folders, and pushed them into the OneDrive environment. Yeah. Okay. And in, and in some ways, you know, I think, hey, you know what, that's great because, you know, Apple has been doing that kind of for a while too. And, um, you know, the byproduct of it though is this, a lot of people get really confused because, because of the change in the operating system, they will have multiple document folders and sometimes they think they're putting it in OneDrive and when they're not, or they put it in their local thing and it's not in OneDrive and they're confused. And so their upgrade process was a little weird. I personally do use OneDrive. However, I disassociated all my local folders from it because I want to control that folder myself. I don't necessarily want everything on my desktop to be out in the cloud or everything in my document folder to be out in the cloud. From the practical standpoint of uh, data security and not losing your work, I think it's wonderful because I think one of the main problems that people have is they save stuff, you know, somebody steals their laptop and all their stuff is gone. Their family photos have disappeared, you know. Uh, so in some ways that's good. But th the problem is, is most people don't have as, as much um, file storage necessity in terms of capacity like I do. <laughs> you know, so for example, if I look at my at my hard drives, and I think we maybe did this last time, if I look at my PC here, you know, it's like, I, I run my drives pretty damn full, you know, and I have like a whole host of other drives and servers here where I store stuff, and that's kind of a pretty normal status for me. But yes, I do have, you know, OneDrive personal, OneDrive for school, um, I, I run Dropbox, I run the Creative Cloud Sync, I also have my Google Drive file stream, and a couple others that I also run. And I, so, but I choose where I put my things. The problem with the new version of Windows 10 uh, and the update that they did is they, they just kind of moved everybody in there. And whether you know it or not, the stuff that was in your documents folder, which might be like your tax returns and stuff, is now out on the cloud. Right. And I don't know how you guys feel about that, but I'm not entirely comfortable with that. Because yeah. I know people can get in there. Right. And that's where I was like, it, like I've been using Google Drive since it came out. But for as long as I can remember but um, you know that's on the on the browser I it's not on my system at least it wasn't <laughs> it's not on my system I, I, I go in there and I know what I'm putting in there but with the when it shows up in the file explorer I'm like uh, it's too close like I don't, I don't know but. now I'm not necessarily uncomfortable with that Anthony but I think that's a really good point and, and when it comes to using these cloud-based storage systems they are not all created equal by the way and frankly uh, you know if you if you want my uh, you know not so humble opinion I suppose um, I don't think that that uh, Google Drive is n even close to being the best of these products for me oh yeah I'm not saying it is I just meant that you know the OneDrive with them doing that it's kind of like I don't know if I want yeah, and that's a, that's a choice you have to make. You can uh, Google a fix for it and disassociate, you know, your folders. Yeah, I did uh, that a while ago. Yeah, me, me too, almost right away. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the one benefit, though, like, for example, if I click on my OneDrive, and this is my, like, personal one, um, 
I do have, you know, what I would call physical folders right here on my machine that also replicate to the crawl, but I'm controlling what goes there. And that, for me, is the important part. Um, the yeah. better the better technology, if you guys just want a helpful tip, Dropbox is by far the killer technology in this field. Uh, it works better. The file shares are better. The upload and download or transfers when you make a change are better. Um, and once again, I have physical folders here on my machine and then, um, you know, uh, the cloud folders as well. So I can go through a browser or uh, work locally. But for me, the combination of local and remote are huge because, for example, if I would work on, you know, for example, in the creative cloud is where I have most of my stuff now. But um, like if I work on uh, actual client website projects, you know, my strategy is that it's here locally on my machine so I get really fast read writes, right? But then it's also replicated to the cloud so I, I don't have to worry about, you know, you know, somebody spilling a soda into my laptop and there goes all my work. You know, so it, it becomes uh, kind of a thing. And, and that's not a way that a lot of people are comfortable, but I, I feel where you're coming from with that, Anthony. Um, the, the beauty, though, it, you know, for Gateway is because we do have Google Drive, I always encourage students to use it. Uh, in terms of what you can do with the spreadsheet tool here, once again, this is not quite Excel. It's not even as good as Excel in the browser, but it is getting better. And here at Gateway, um, when we do things like scheduling, you know, it's all through these shared spreadsheets. You know, we do a lot of our planning that way. Um, and so, if if and when you get your your Excel skills down pat, you know, all those skills basically transfer here. The formulas are basically identical or really similar. Um, the only thing that I find a little bit cumbersome is like some of the navigation around the screen, but it, it's mostly a by, byproduct of the fact that we're in browser rather than in product. But I, I do want you to be aware of these. Now the other question you might have is, are there other spreadsheet products? And the answer of course is yes. Does, can anybody name any? Okay, don't all jump up at once. <laughs> you know, and, and the truth is, it, um, it's, it's kind of irrelevant if you do or you don't, but there are a lot of what we call um, office suites that are available that are what we call open office suites. And, and open office is actually one of them, and there's LibreOffice and, and a few others, that all of which have um, spreadsheet tools attached. Uh, if you work on a Mac platform, and I think maybe a couple of us do, what's the big, what's the big spreadsheet product on a Mac? Pages. Okay. And, and you know what? That's actually a pretty good tool, but it's still not as, as good as Excel. Um, but I, I don't think there's any harm uh, done in knowing those products. So if you want to explore them, feel free. But Excel is our tool of choice here. Um, and yeah, and this is something I'm going to announce to you guys later on, but that's, uh, let's move on. All right. So I think we covered that stuff pretty well. Um, the next thing I, I want to do is I kind of want to point us towards the, the PowerPoint here. So I'm actually going to open it up. But before I do that, I do want to show you that I have a series of video links here. And I don't want to uh, waste the class time, frankly, uh, by playing them like I did in our last session. So I do encourage you to uh, go in here and look at these. These videos, the four links that you see here are all video links. Uh, they all come from the same Excel course in LinkedIn Learning, formerly known as lynda.com. Um, and if you are pretty fresh to this, hey, you know what? These are pretty quick, easy watches. Um, you know, go into the platform, and I always recommend turn, turn the playback speed up a little bit so you can get through them faster. Maybe like 1.25 or 1.5 and plow through them. Um, but you will find some of these videos when they get to the later parts of their coursework they actually will come in handy if you're looking for how do I right and with a product like Excel this is what happens it is so complicated that even if you're using it fairly often and you learn something really advanced it's not unusual for you to like oh man I, I did that a few years ago I don't remember how to do it now I got to look it up you know and LinkedIn learning actually becomes a pretty good resource that way of course you can always YouTube stuff and and whatever uh, or just straight up Google it um, but because Excel is such a popular product there is significant training material online for this 
Um, where the training online falls short is when it gets to the advanced levels. So when you get to real high-end statistical analysis and doing like what-if scenarios and running solver or mini-tab resident inside the product. Or if you want to take it even further, one capability that Excel has that these other products do not is the ability to also include programming code directly into your spreadsheets. So if your spreadsheet formulas can't do what you think you'd like to do, you can write code to, to augment. And we don't really dig into that too deep here, uh, but that is an area to explore uh, for the future for sure. So watch those videos. So for right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to pull the PowerPoint down here. And I'm, I'm actually being kind of foolish here because I think I might already have it up and running on my screen. I sure do. So I didn't need to do that. So now I have an extra copy. Fantastic. Uh, and the first thing you're going to notice when you go into this uh, slideshow here are the number of slides. There are 53 slides in here. And oh my God, no, I am not lecturing on every slide. Uh, I, I will very quickly uh, and strategically go through these. But I think now is a wonderful time for a break. We are about an hour in. Um, and it's uh, about 6.25. So let's, let's do a five-minute break. Uh, return at 6.30 and then we'll pick up from here. All right, sound good? Okay, we're back from break and we are uh, in the uh, slideshow here and I was uh, just mentioning to the class that this uh, slideshow comes from uh, a textbook that we use for our advanced Excel course here at Gateway um, and uh, it covers in the first chapter in, in the slideshow some of the rudiments of working with Excel. Um, I assume you guys know some of these things already and uh, we will kind of quickly step through some of the real basic stuff. Uh, but at any point along the way, please feel free to ask a question or ask me to demonstrate. All right. I will launch Excel, and you can see I have it uh, on my taskbar down here, uh, and get the product up and running. So we have it available just in case. All right, so Excel is up on the screen, and I will just create a, a blank workbook just to have it ready to go. Um, all right, I'm going to switch back over to the slideshow here and let's proceed. All right, so the, the, the topics covered here in uh, this slideshow are as listed. So I'll let you read that for yourself. Some real basics. All right. And then, you know, we get into, you know, what is the spreadsheet? We kind of already have talked about that, I think, pretty well. But it's basically a format for creating what we call tabular data. You know, so in other words, rows and columns of information, and that concept, or you know, that uh, you know, structure, data structure is really what it is, um, is one of the most fundamental and important data structures we have in the world of IT. It is extremely useful for organizing data um, and putting it into categories and identifying it and uh, ultimately analyzing it. Um, and then also used for the presentation of the information, uh, aside from just the analysis of it. Uh, whenever you work with, um, you know, a spreadsheet, you know, I always tell people that whenever you create a brand new spreadsheet, the very, very first thing you should do, and this is really kind of one of my general IT rules, is if you're working in any sort of a, a tool that allows you to uh, save and create files, the moment you create a new file, which is what I have done here, and you know, maybe maybe I maybe I did that you know off screen a little too quickly, um, but when you launch Excel, um, let's go through that process again with the Office 365 version and 2016 and 2019 versions of the installed. Uh, you will be presented with a screen like this when you start, including um, you know a bunch of options to access recently opened documents, uh, access to the tutorials, and, and you know you should check those out if you're pretty fresh to this. Um, but I'm going to start with a blank workbook. And the moment I start with any new file, my first practice, and I learned this a long, long time ago, um, was to directly save the file, the first the first task, you know. So that, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I am just going to drop this one on my desktop. And um, I'm using, uh, you know, the browse interface here to get there. And I'm just going to call it uh, example unit two. 
and I'm just saving on my desktop. I don't know if this is even going to be a keeper of any sort. Probably not. But now I have it saved. You know, so at least I have my starting point. And I always suggest to you that you do that uh, as a good practice. Now, if you notice up at, at the top here, there is this thing called autosave um, on Excel. And for those of us that are used to working with Microsoft Word, Microsoft Word decades ago um, uh, decided right from the get-go when the product came out that um, a really powerful feature for a word processor would be like, why don't we just have this save every five minutes automatically um, so that people don't lose their work? And I, it's a brilliant feature. But you notice on Excel, by default, it is not turned on. And sometimes uh, people who work with Excel do not want that turned on. You know, and that tends to be my preference as well. And so I have to be conscious of when I'm going to say it. They have conveniently provided an easy switch here in the in the title bar that you can turn on and off. So if you are let's just, just raw entering data, autosave would be intelligent, right? So every few minutes that it autosaves, I think is smart. If I am working on maybe developing really complicated formulas and I'm not really sure where I'm at with it, I don't necessarily want that to autosave, you know. Um, but that's really kind of up to you. They do also have the quick little save icon right in the toolbar as well. And you're always welcome to, as you can see from the little pop-up that came up, Control S will save any spreadsheet as well. Okay, so those are just the basics. Um, now, when you're working in the product, and as you can see here, and I'll give it just a, a click of zoom, not that much zoom, sorry about that. I just wanted to zoom in a little bit. Um, you know, they, they show you kind of like the anatomy of how Excel works, and they, and they point to this little box up here, which shows you what the current working cell is. So if I'm in Excel, and I'm in, in this cell here, which is column F, row 5, that's listed here. It will also, um, you know, give you a shortcut list here, too, once you start to actually do stuff in the product, where you can kind of directly jump to a cell, uh, which is useful. Um, whenever the cell is active, you will see that green highlight around it uh, to let you know. Um, and then, of course, the row and the column headers are in the sidebars. Um, one thing that they're doing here is they're actually going through and they're, they're putting in um, a, a title for the, the worksheet and they're typing it right into the worksheet, you, you notice. And that's something that you can do yourself. But you can actually just take, go into any cell at any point in time and they are going to sell A1. So I'll just follow along with them. Uh, and, you know, now this is something, you know, frankly, that I do sometimes and sometimes I don't. You know, it depends on what I'm working on. Where, you know, sometimes I just have raw data in my spreadsheets. But other times, the spreadsheet is meant to be uh, formatted to present to others. And in that case, uh, if I'm not sure that another person could look at it and make sense of it, a title is encouraged. Now, you notice that you know, the, the, the cell is a certain size. And as I started typing into it, it overflowed the boundaries of the cell. And um, that will often happen. You can control that, by the way. So you can make the text wrap in the cell, if you wish or you can let it do its default overflow. For now, I'm just going to leave it like that. Um, but they're, they're trying to show you that in, in the, uh, uh, the spreadsheet. Every time you, you finish typing something into an Excel spreadsheet and you either press Enter or the Tab key, those are the two big keys in Excel, by the way, you will move to the next cell. And some of that is kind of predetermined by what you're working on. So like if I'm uh, just typing text like this and I press Enter, it goes down to the next cell. If I pre press text like this and hit tab, oh, wait, that moved a different direction. Notice it's going across now. And those are those are two navigation things. Maybe you guys are already aware of them, um, but those are the two key ways we move around. So tab moves to the right, enter takes you down to the next line. And depending on the kind of information you're entering, so if I was entering like uh, maybe somebody's name and then their age, um, I might use the tab key because it's all in the same row. And then if I know that I'm going to go to the next one, now see how Excel says, hey, you pressed enter, you want to go back to the beginning. It just did it automatically. So I think, I think that's helpful. All right. So, some more things here. You know, notice is as you start to type different stuff in, 
um, you know, one of the things that we do with the spreadsheets is make rows and columns of information, and they're doing the same thing here. So they're starting by, you know, creating column headers, and, um, you know, they're not very pretty right now, but they typed them in all the way across. And then they start to enter in some of the information. And notice you can enter a mix of words and numbers. But when you put in a word, you notice how text will automatically, by default, align to the left, and numbers will automatically align to the right. And that's kind of a difference. But that is something you can control. But the default is the numbers align to the right, because as numbers grow, you know, we think of, you know, the ones digit is off to the right. So as the number gets bigger, it grows in that direction, where if words grow, they grow in that direction. So there's a reason why they do it. It's not, not an accident. All right, so talking once again about all the, the navigation keys, you know, as I mentioned, enter and tab are the two, you know, most important ones, you know. Uh, move over or move down, or enter and tab. Um, notice that um, there's other things that you can do though. So if I'm not actively typing, I can also use my arrow keys to move around. Um, and so that, many of us will automatically default to that. Uh, there's a couple of uh, shortcut keys though. So for example, if you are, if you're tabbing through a document, so here I am and I'm tabbing, so I'm going to the right, but let's say I want to go the other direction, I can hold my shift key and go the other direction, by the way. Um, the other one that, that's like super helpful kind of hard to demonstrate in some circumstances is that the last couple listed so if you hold on your control key and hit home it takes you to cell A1 if you hold on the control key and hit end it takes you to the bottom most cell that you have filled out <laughs> by the way um, now the spreadsheets can get quite large at times and if you had information all the way in the bottom rightmost corner and it was 10,000 lines long control end would take you right to that cell and so this control home is much more likely to be used and that's one I do use pretty often by the way that trick works in a lot of different types of editors word processors coding tools etc that's a really cool uh, trick and in fact it works in web browsers as well by the way uh, so this this is a good one if you don't know those um, now of course somebody say well can't I just move around with the mouse sure <laughs> why not but you know the, the people who really know spreadsheets well if you watch them work very often are using a combination of uh, keystrokes um, and shortcut keys more so than they use a mouse to move around the screen and, and people who are Excel power users if you ever sit down and watch one you would be amazed at some of the weird shortcut keys they know I know some and some of them really are, are kind of remnants from days of old um, but there are some that you might not be aware of um, which we'll discuss as we go All right. now um, the next uh, slide here uh, really is kind of about how they're organizing things. You know, once again, they're, they're showing that like people entering information. Um, and then finally, they're getting to the point where uh, it looks like they're ready to enter in a total. But really, they're kind of navigating around the screen. And I'm sure if you were taking, you know, a formal Excel class, you know, that you'd probably get a whole demonstration on that. Um, when we... Um, want to start to change information and the thing that they're pointing out here is you know with when you have a cell like this where the information spills over and then I want to put something in column B like they did like worksheet well all of a sudden your stuff here is obscure right so how do I get that to show does anybody know alright well let me answer for you right the one way you can do do it is you come up here and you you notice how each one of the columns has a divider the rows also have them by the way you can just come up here and when it changes to this double headed arrow with a with a line in between you can click drag and just make it bigger and then you can keep moving it until it all fits right um, uh, double click on. yeah there there's there's the grand trick and and that's my favorite is if you know that stuff it needs to be bigger you can just double click on the column header and then it will auto adjust to whatever the whitest item in that column is now in some cases that's exactly what you want and fair warning in some cases it's not right so for example if I was um, let's say doing what they're doing so maybe maybe I have uh, let, let me create some column headers first so maybe I'll do like uh, name I don't want it all caps um, age, for example, um, 
address, something like that. And I'm maybe only gathering first names. And I put Joe in here. And then I put in his age again of 45 and his address of like one, two, three, like Elm Street or whatever. Um, I, I see a couple problems already. Well, first of all, Elm Street's overflowing. You know, let's fix that. I'm going to double click. There it is, right? But then I'm noticing, oh, wait, I put this worksheet up here thing, and now I can't read all of that, so I'm going to double click that, and I'm like, wait, 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 I don't want that to happen, right? And so you're going to have these little conundrums like this, and, and sometimes it'll adjust the way you want it, and sometimes it won't. Um, it is an automatic tool, so whenever, like, you change something, so if I came in here and say I decided to make that bigger, um, like via bolding it or maybe bumping up the font size it's going to affect it and then you will need to kind of readjust it again now whether or not you want it to appear that way is a whole separate issue to me it seems like it would look better if you know this worksheet thing was not here so I can just pick pick that up and move it or delete it or whatever um, and then I can readjust this back and then that will just overflow as it did and, and that's kind of the, the point of what they're showing us now, another thing that we might want to choose to do is um, maybe we want to enter multiple pieces of in, uh, information uh, like we had, and then we want this, instead of being stretching over a few different cells where I want, might want to put stuff, I don't want that even to be a possibility. So I can say that it looks like this one's going to spread over four columns, and I can use this tool up here in the toolbar called Merge and Center. And what it does is it basically eliminates you know, all the subcells in here. So now it's one cell. But I, I do want you to notice as I move out of it, it's still called A1. So what happened to B1, C1, and D1? No longer accessible. Okay. Um, and, and this can be undone, by the way. So if I go into this cell, uh, not only can I merge it, but I can also uh, unmerge it. And, you know, that that's a, a, a choice that you often make. Notice how the, the formatting kind of broke a little bit, so I do have to put it back. But that's something you can play with, um, and you know whatever data is there, just beware. If there's data in the other cells, they will go away. Uh, what will take precedence is the first cell. That's I think the point of the slide predominantly, and so they they show that here. So they demonstrate it, and then of course that little tidbit here of worksheet was blown away because that wasn't in the first cell. It's the first cell that takes the precedence. All right, so I think that, that shows that. And they're really, what they're doing is they're showing you how you can make it look a little nicer. Um, eventually, at some point, you're going to end up doing some math in here, you know, and, and actually a whole lot of it. And just like with most programming languages, um, there are rules for uh, arithmetic operators. And these are the symbols. And, and I think most of you are uh, familiar with these. But there's a couple wrinkles, OK? So the plus and minus signs, uh, no brainers. For most of us, the asterisk for multiplication and the forward slash for division, also no-brainers. I mean, those are very common. Um, those are the same things that we learned in the Python class, for example. And most programming languages use exactly those same conventions. In fact, if you look at your keyboard and you happen to have a 10-key number pad off to the side, those are the exact symbols that are used for multiplication, subtraction, division, and... Uh, whatever else I missed. <laughs> I forget which one I missed. Anyhow, uh, the ones that, that might throw you a little bit um, are the percent sign and the caret, because here the percent sign is the percent sign, right? Whereas if we think of a programming language, often the percent sign is used for what activity? Uh, modulus. modulus division, right? Which is remainder division, where we get just the remainder. Um, so in Excel, that actually goes back to being a percent sign. And whenever we are working with a percent sign, really what we are in essence doing is we're taking a number. Um, and, you know, so for example, if I type, um, you know, 50% here, what is that equivalent to? 0.5. But here I entered it as text. And I, and I just want you to be aware that if I type 0.5, now why did it... I typed 0.5. Why did it go to percentage right away? And, and the answer for that, folks, is it auto-formatted it. So let me just give you another example. If I type the number 1 and then click on the cell and then click on the Format button up here, it will switch it to a percentage for me because 1 is equal to 100%. 
But you notice because I had typed in the percent sign here and then later came back, the formatting stuck. So if I type 0.25, it's going to give me 25%. Can I disable that? Absolutely. You can change it. You can unformat it if you wish. But right now the format sticks, but you can come up here and change those uh, cell formatting things at any time. In some cases, you'll learn that you can actually uh, customize some of those formats too, or even develop your own, and get, that gets a little more advanced, but that's a possibility. The other one that's a little weird is the carrot. You know, so when um, you learn some programming languages, and I, I use that cautiously again, um, you use the caret symbol to raise something to a power. And uh, in Excel, that is what we use. Do you guys remember what we used in Python to do the same thing? Isn't it x6, x6? Correct, Arnie. That, that is right on target. So in Python, we would use a pair of asterisks to do it. In other programming languages, though, and most of them, and I, I, I should say that cautiously, uh, many of them, <laughs> you know, the caret symbol is actually used more than the double asterisk. Some programming languages don't even allow for it uh, in mathematical notation, and you have to use custom formulas to, uh, or uh, classes to do it. All right, so we, we are venturing into the formula area now, and here's where I'm going to start to demonstrate a little bit of this. And it helps to have a few few numbers. So let, let's just kind of, I'm going to kind of um, just find a column here and start typing in some some numbers. Uh, with you know, Probably they shouldn't all be the same, I suppose. <laughs> And I'm just randomly hitting keys on my, on my number pad, by the way. And here I have a column of numbers, whatever they might happen to represent. Um, and now I want to get a total for these numbers. And, and one of the things that you know, I don't think is, is mentioned here is Excel has some tools that are automatically built in because sometimes people just want a quick answer or don't even want to type a formula. So the first thing uh, I always show students, and, and many are not aware of this, even experienced Excel users, which always blows me away, is that if you just highlight the numbers, do you notice down here in the toolbar, it gave me the count, it gave me the sum, and the average. I didn't have to type a formula at all. So here's like a really quick and easy tool. This is very, very helpful, by the way. And so if you're, you just want to do some really quick analysis without typing a formula, um, those are some of the key things that we would do. Sum, a count, and an average. And of course, those three things are mathematically related, obviously, right? Because you can't get an average without counting and without the sum. Um, and so, you know, those are interesting. All right. But let's say I do want to create a formula to summarize these numbers or, or come up with a total. Any formula that we're going to enter is going to start with the equal sign. Right? And then you would basically either issue a function command and Excel has many built-in functions, or you just simply start using cell references with mathematical symbols. So for example, if I want to add together this whole column of numbers, I could do this. I could say equals, tells that it's a formula. Then I click on the first cell, plus sign, second cell, plus sign, third cell, plus sign. And you can see, I mean, it's a little cumbersome, but you can, you know, I wouldn't want to do this with 10,000 numbers, but you could. <laughs> Not recommended, but you could. Uh, and then once I have the final number there, I press on Enter, and there's a the total. All right, and, and that and that's a perfectly valid formula. And, and you can see uh, very easily um, that you can go in there and manipulate it. So if you want to change to multiplication or division or whatever, it's doable. But that is kind of the long way around, frankly. I mean, it's really... Uh, not recommended. You would maybe use that for simple calculations with very few numbers. When you really have a column of numbers like this, the better tool is to use a function, and we will learn these functions, uh, but a real basic one is sum. So you can say equals, you type in the function name. Now you also see like the, the suggest list, so there's more than one version of sum on top of it all. And then you put in a set of parentheses, and I start with the open parentheses, and then you can just take your mouse, click, drag, highlight the whole range, and close it. And look at the syntax of it, by the way. It says F8 colon F14, so we're starting on cell F8, 
all the way through F14. We can close the parentheses, press enter, and come up with the same amount. Now, if you're doing, you know, large quantities of numbers, this is a lot more logical to use than, uh, you know, F8 plus F9 plus F10, and good luck, we'll see you tomorrow when you get done typing it all that in, right? And, and that's really what it's about, is working smarter. Um, now, even more fascinating, for really, really common things like this, like creating a sum of numbers, I can be in the cell, and I can just come up here to this tool, by the way, uh, I hit some button, it guessed, right? It guessed based upon what I have entered and how it's laid out, and it wrote the formula for me, and I have the same answer. And some of you know this already, and that's fantastic. And once again, this, these are rudimentary formulas. Um, another really interesting thing um, is, you know, I, we talked earlier about older spreadsheet products, for example, like Lotus123. Um, and uh, VisiCalc and some of those tools. And, you know, in the old days when, when people were predominantly um, using Lotus123 as the primary spreadsheet product. So I told you, like, when I started in IT and I started working in an office space, it was Lotus. You know, it wasn't Excel. Excel was a new thing. And it was like, why should we use Excel? <laughs> you know, it's made by the evil Microsoft Corporation. But, um, you know, people were used to writing formulas in Lotus. And in Lotus, we used a different symbol to start our formulas. Does anybody know what that one is? Uh, what, what did you say, uh, Anthony? Is that I'm not sure. Yeah, that, that's quite all right. And, you know, in fact, sometimes I forget, and I think, I think it's a combination of uh, either a minus sign, and then you do stuff like sum, so you see how that works? So that's what we did in Lotus. And, I, and if I remember right, I think VisiCalc was the one where they used, maybe it was a uh, single apostrophe or a double apostrophe, but I still, you know, um, you know, I guess I really don't encounter it anymore, but when I, when I used to teach some of this stuff uh, decades ago, uh, people would go, I, you know, I put in my minus sign, I'm like, what are you doing? That's a negative number. No, 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 no. <laughs> it still denotes, and it still works in Excel that you can do a formula. Um, but Excel prefers the equal sign, by the way. So I, I think that's a nice historical... Uh, uh, tidbit. They do walk through uh, doing some of the math. So uh, Excel, you know, it does allow you, you know, to operate and do formulas based on cell references. And, and I, I just want to kind of point out the importance of cell references. And uh, frankly, when we are working with Excel, it is completely possible you know, that I could be primitive and I could do something really dumb like this, right? Like, look, I have all these numbers. I need a total, right? And so I'll, I'll go to my calculator and pull that up and then just start typing the numbers in and then put the answer in the other cell. You yeah, know, not smart. The other thing that you could do is I could also write a formula here that instead of using a cell reference, I would use the number. So I could go 654 uh, plus... Uh, 654 plus 65 plus 654, you know, etc., and write the formula that way. Now, that will still give me the right answer, right? Absolutely. But where Excel excels is in the fact that we use references to the cells as opposed to using the data in the cells. So we are, when we write a formula that says we're going to add this cell to this cell, these representations of the position on the spreadsheet are called cell references. And folks, this is really the magic power of Excel because we, if at any point, decide that this value is changing. Maybe we typed it in wrong or maybe it, it's, it is a dynamic value and I type in something else, then the formula already uh, or automatically changes with it. Right, so I don't have to go back here and update my formula. I've changed one hard-coded value. The cell reference dynamically adjusts. And, and whether you realize it or not, that's probably you know, one of the biggest powerful things in spreadsheets uh, overall. Now, whenever you're working with a formula, this, this slide is showing us that the formula will always appear up in the address bar. And when you are typing them in, by the way, there's no reason why you have to type it here. 
you can simply click on the cell, come up to the formula toolbar, and type it up here uh, just as easily as you can type it uh, anywhere else. And so in this case, maybe I'll do a little subtraction. Um, so either spot where you type it is okay. Ultimately, if you're looking to see what's in this cell, now that it's resolved to a number, the only place I can see the formula that created it is up here. And so sometimes after the, the information is already present. So these two are, are some sort of a total, so I'll make them bolder so we can know they're different. But this shows us a number, but the reality is, is there's a formula behind it. And if I click on one of the hard-coded numbers, then the formula bar shows what's behind it, which is an actual number. And so that's one thing that often confuses people, too, with spreadsheets initially. Uh, my, my anticipation is it's not confusing any of you, which is fine. Um, so whatever formulas you create, um, you know, you can use all the different uh, things and everything will be really kind of dependent on what task you're trying to complete, you know. So um, the math will be dictated by whatever your situation is. Um, the other uh, little thing that they're pointing here is showing how to do uh, division. And so, I mean, I think that's kind of a no-brainer. Once again, you can see from the slide that they are using cell references, but the cell itself shows the numeric output or the result of the formula, not the formula itself. All right. If you happen to see your formula in the cell, <laughs> you know, that's a tip that, hey, uh, it's not actually a formula. You know, and usually uh, the thing that people forget to do is to put the equal sign at the beginning. Okay, that, that remember that the equal sign is the the indicator that you're creating a formula. All right, and so all of these now have formulas in there, and if I would click on any uh, given box, they would show the value. Uh, we already kind of played with the column widths and stuff, but you know, it is possible to actually bring up the dialog box for adjusting the column widths if you want to do it that way. Um, you will notice, uh, for example, that if you click on something like this, and let's say I want to change the height of this row, um, as I click and hold and prepare to drag, do you notice how it brings up a little tooltip showing me how many pixels or what the height is? Uh, I'm not sure what the 15 means exactly, but it tells you it's 20 pixels, and then as I change it, um, it'll show you that, that value. You can also select multiple rows simultaneously and then adjust them collectively. You know, so if I want everything to be a certain exact amount, I can do that. Um, so I think those, those are all helpful uh, little tips. Now, I personally, I tend to use um, you know, the, the little divider tool to do the adjustments more so than bringing up the dialog box. And that's just my preference because I see the results rather than guessing at numbers. Um, there was a time with Excel like way, way, way long ago that um, I wasn't aware of that. And I would always bring up the dialog box to change them. Um, and as is true with many of the office applications, there are, you know, um, usually multiple ways to accomplish the same thing. And I always find it very amusing when I watch an old school Excel person use Excel and they want to do something like, for example, delete a column where you can just highlight the column, right click and delete. Uh, and then if you look at somebody like me that knows the old, the old Alt-E-D trick, which isn't working right now, but it, you could, for example, in one single cell, you know, delete the cell. And, and, and you know, that's an old school shortcut that nobody knows, right? Uh, these days you would just delete it, <laughs> you know, but in the old days we would sometimes use shortcut keys and all the contents would shift. Uh, I think we uh, talked about that enough, adjusting columns and widths and cell styles, but the, thing, the other thing that they're, they're um, you know, pointing out here is that Excel, uh, you know, a few significant versions back started adding um, like pre-configured styles um, to um, the spreadsheet so you like if you have a certain amount of data like loaded in and you want to like pretty it up and um, give it like a look you know if you will uh, of course it helps to maybe have a couple more pieces of information in the table um, and maybe they can just all have the same address
right? And I can take this information here, and then I can come up to the, the cell styles and choose one of the pre-configured uh, styles. And you can see how it changes the colors. Uh, and you know, in fact, if, I, if I'm deciding, okay, wait, this is my heading, I can come up here and I, I really like working with, uh, let's say, this color scheme. Um, and then I can highlight all of these and come up here and very, very quickly uh, come up with you know, a look or a feel or a color or a scheme or whatever without really spending any time manually creating these things. Um, you know, so that is very helpful. And um, the other thing that you can do, and I'm going to undo my changes here, is you can actually highlight all of these things and they have the format as a table tool where you know uh, they will have you um, and they're asking me where the data is so this this tool of course necessitates you to actually look but what this says here and I want you to notice it says basically A5 through C9 so A5 is the starting cell and C9 is the ending cell so the opposite corners uh, and, it, and I'm checking the box that says my table has headers and then I allow it to do the formatting and then automatically it put in lines and colors and even more interestingly uh, filters you know so if I have a bunch of different information here and let's say I only want to find the ones that have one uh, it'll filter it for me and so these are, these are just amazing automatic tools that they've added in um, and a lot of people don't know that they're there, but you can make your data look beautiful without a lot of work. Um, I, you know, I tend to be, uh, you know, more of the old school mentality myself, where I usually do the, the formatting myself. Um, but hey, there's nothing wrong with choosing a pre-designed style that looks really good and just applying it to something that you have, and boom, 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 you're done. And then you can show it to your boss or your manager and convey the information real concisely. You know. And you know why do we stylize and color things? Because it's easier to look at, and it's easier to make sense of the information. Um, and, and notice on many of these, they do the alternating row colors, uh, so you can easily see the differences in the cells. All right, now, applying you know the the cell styles. You know here they're talking about applying bold. Uh, and italics and, and things like that and I'm, I'm assuming you guys are probably okay with that feature um, but those are you know very commonly in the toolbar up here as are you know font colors font sizes font choices and uh, borders and, and borders are one of those things where they those get a little bit um, uh, tricky and of course here we've talked about the sum function already so we are skipping over that let's move fast <laughs> um, and they're they're showing us basically I, I think the the same essential thing uh, that I did. And they're uh, kind of just going through the whole process of it. Now another thing that that's really kind of neat about Excel, and I love this feature. And I'll tell you what happened uh, when I first encountered it. It was such an aha for me. You know, I was like practically jumping up and down in my seat. I was so happy. You know, because I would do these reports in the old days when I was, uh, I worked as a computer support person initially in my IT career, you know, and I would have to, you know, always generate reports, you know. So, like, very commonly, maybe you'd have a column of numbers or something, you know, so, um, and you would do something like this. So, all right, well, I'm going to do one here, this is two, this is three, this is four, this is five, and I would just keep typing until I got to, like, 100 or whatever I needed to get to, and I'm like, oh, man, you know, what a pain, you know? sit there for 10 minutes typing that silly thing in and then when I discovered that Excel recognizes patterns and you can use um, that pattern recognition to autocomplete information so for example if I highlight this pattern which clearly in increases by one each time I can then go to this list and then by grabbing that little square in the bottom corner like this and dragging and you notice it even shows me how far I'm getting. So if I want to go to 100, I just keep dragging until I get to 100. And I stop right there, and it's done. And, and I don't know if you know this trick or not, right? And so that, that's a really easy number sequence. But I can also go A, B, C, and highlight these, and it will recognize the alphabetic characters as well. Or does it? Hmm. 
Okay, it doesn't. But what if you're working with a date? What if what if today is? Um, well, let's just start with January first, right? And then you know what? We have a class meeting next week, so that would be January eighth. And then I'm like, well, I got to do this for the whole semester. If I highlight the first two, it'll recognize it's a date. The dates are a week apart. And as I go, you'll notice that the numbers increase, you know, on a weekly basis until we get, get to the end of the semester. Now, what happened here? Why, why are some of these not showing correctly? Why do I have pound size instead of dates? Well, the answer is, if you don't know, yeah, they're, 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 not, they're not fitting in the box. So once I expand the box, you notice I double click the little divider up here. Now they fit. And so like if information doesn't fit, often it will be represented like that. But this is very helpful, a uh, very helpful tool. Um, the other thing that, that is very helpful about it, and, and I'm just gonna kind of take a random set of numbers here and just paste them in. And I think this is a really important takeaway, by the way. So I got uh, two columns of numbers. Uh, this one, let's make them the same length just to make it, excuse me, easier. And then I decide that here I want to do a sum um, of all these numbers. And then, you know, I want to do the same thing here. Well, this formula, if you look at it, refers to the cells H8, H8, through H18, right? So if I look at that formula. Now, I can actually take that formula and either control C, copy it, control C, right? Or um, I can grab the little square again and just drag it to the right and it will copy that same formula over. But notice when I click on this cell, it has correctly adjusted to the other column because the cell references that I have here are relative. And so when I moved my formula from one column to another, it kept the same row values, but it changed the column value. It, it recognized that I'm in a different column and probably want to total these numbers. And now if I move it over again, you know, and of course it comes up with zero, but if you look at the formula, it's already. So if I start typing numbers in here, and you notice Letters by mistake don't add to the formula, but that will automatically tabulate. And, and this is a really important thing because these formulas are what we call, you know, um, cell references, and the cell references are relative to the position of the formula. And, and if I didn't want to do that, for example, I'll go back to the original formula, I can do one really interesting thing which is to create what we call an absolute cell reference. And this becomes very important for the kind of work we're going to do uh, in many capacities. I can insert a dollar sign in front of each one of the row and column designators. So by doing that, what I'm saying to the formula is, if you're copy and pasted somewhere else, you are still referring absolutely back to H8 through H18. So if I take this formula now and drag it across, you will notice it's still totaling the first column. Okay. Now if the formula had removed, for example, the dollar sign from the H position, and, and this is pretty fascinating, and actually, this is not the one I want to do it in. So let's say I do it in the second cell. If I remove the dollar sign in front of the column indicator, is it still referring back to the same thing? Well, it is because I'm still saying H here, aren't I? Right? But if this formula now was pasted here, notice what happened, right? So I, I copied it from this, from the other column and now it thinks it's tabulating the G column because I moved one over to the left from where I was which was the I column but it was referring and still is to H 
And if I move it one over to the right, it's just changing it because the dollar sign is now missing. So by putting the dollar sign in there, it pins down either the row or the column or both. And most typically, you will use both, by the way. And th this is a really kind of goofy thing to play with, but this is called absolute cell reference versus relative cell reference. Okay. Um, don't expect you to memorize that all right away, but I, I think that's a, a, a pretty good one. Um, and so, you know, the, the autofill tool, they kind of go through the process of demonstrating uh, how that works um, and then how if you copy it to different rows and we kind of uh, did all that. Um, they also show you, you know, and, I'm, and, and frankly, I'm not always a huge fan of using this little icon that pops up, but, you know, you, you can get into the habit of playing with that. And so like if I have a column of numbers and it gives me the little box and you click on it, well, it allows me to do a whole bunch of, of different things. So I mean, I'm not programming anything here, folks. This has just come up from this little box, right? So I can take those numbers and do a little bar chart right inside the cell. I can, I can color code it. I can uh, create icons. Um, you know, what is greater than or less than each specific value? What's the top 10%? Uh, whatever. Um, I can do charts, uh, you know, etc. They're all listed here. Do I want to do sums, average, count, <laughs> total percentage, etc., etc., etc.? And that's just really quick and easy. And you know what? And, and this is the beautiful thing, uh, by the way, of working with this product, is it gives you that capability, right? Without necessarily having to dig through menus. Uh, or f fiddle with things. So really common day-to-day -day calculations and operations are readily available. And I think that was really, I think that's really kind of a cool demonstration, especially when you do like this and the box pops up. Um, and, you know, if you just get to, you know, the, the mathematical functions alone, you know, um, I think that's fantastic. You know, really, really cool tool. And they're trying to basically point you out uh, to do that. All right. Another thing you can do, and, and yes, um, you know, this is not really necessarily a document uh, tool, um, but you can uh, do some uh, formatting uh, and make things look very beautiful. I have at times, you know, when I when I found it cumbersome to work with uh, Word to make a document look nice for a certain purpose, um, sometimes I go to Excel, you know. Um, and use it to create a printed document or a PDF. Um, um, so that's helpful to know. <clears throat> now, another thing that, that you can do, so if you have really large numbers, you can have Excel drop commas in for formatting and uh, put in, for example, uh, decimal places for currency amounts. And, and let's, let's just explore that really quickly. So let's say this, this number here is actually uh, a numeric uh, dollar amount, you know, and you know because we are used to working with dollars and cents, it will format it for us. So you can take any number and very quickly and easily convert it to this format. And so you see how I put the dollar sign in front and then gave me the decimal point and uh, two decimal places after because that's standard for uh, our American uh, monetary system, right? If I happen to have a number that is very, very large. And so I will uh, type one. And uh, notice what happened when it didn't fit in the cell. The first thing it did is it changed it to uh, scientific notation. And what this stands for is 3.12 whatever uh, as times 10 to the 12th power is what that represents. But I can make the, the cell bigger so the whole thing expands. But then I can also do this where I can format it with commas. Now, numerically, I do want you to notice that up in the formula bar, there's no commas in the number. This is just what we're seeing in the cell, right? And the reason we do that is because it's a whole, whole lot easier to determine if it's, you know, that's, you know, hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, trillions, okay. Because <laughs> you know, that's how the human brain works. And we are taught, you know, when we are in school mathematically that, um, that's how you format a number, right? But the reality is, is, in the background, Excel does not need that in any way, shape, or form. But these are 
auto format tools that are built in. You can control these things, by the way, and so um, you can determine where the commas display. Uh, you can also uh, determine um, how currency formats display and how percentages display. You can control those aspects. Typically, we don't really alter them much, but I have seen circumstance. Um, for example, and I forget which monetary system it was, but not all monetary systems have like a dollar unit and then cents. And some of them just deal with the unit uh, and have no decimal places. And other ones have more decimal places. Um, and so you, those are all controllable items. And I, I think a really good one too to, to note is maybe something like this. So if I have a very uh, small number as opposed to a very large one, and I say maybe something like, uh, you know, just, ty just typing one in. And, you know, it just took whatever I typed and, and put it in the cell. But there's no reason why the, all of that um, has to show. So they do have this toolbar up here where you can increase or decrease the decimal. And I want you to watch what happens as I increase it. Right now it's including all the values I typed. And then if I decrease it, what it's actually doing is it's, taking that last digit and rounding it using like standard rounding procedures. Um, also very important to note because sometimes when you're looking at a number and if it's, you know, you got a reduced number of decimal places, is it 0.3? Well, not really. See, it's not really 0.3. So it's sometimes, despite what you see on the screen, you have to look at that formula bar for what's really there. All right, moving along. Uh, I think we, we covered a lot of uh, this stuff pretty well. There is spell checking built in, by the way, if you want to uh, exercise it. I, I don't anticipate we'll be using that one uh, uh, too much. Uh, every once in a while, you'll get these little message boxes. Those aren't really very important either. All right. If we are uh, actually looking at, um, you know, printing a document, they have some guides here uh, for doing uh, printing and cr coming up with headers and footers and margins and all those things. Again, I'm not super concerned about this because we're not really going to be outputting to the screen much, but I just do want you to know that through the print interfaces, you can control how it outputs. And, and frankly, folks, you would be surprised how many people use tools like Excel to actually format printed documents just because of the the capability it has with rows and columns and keeping things uh, orderly. And um, I think that's pretty uh, helpful. Uh, now another thing that's kind of weird is you do have the capability if you want and there's a button in the toolbar like they show if you want to actually see the formulas that you're working with in the spreadsheet itself instead of the result of the formula they do have that show formula button that you can click on and actuate um, you know that the visibility of it and sometimes that's helpful because it helps you to validate for example are you summing the right numbers you know, if you maybe you're like, uh, these totals don't look right to me. So you show formulas are like, oh, yeah, no wonder the formula is wrong, right? You know, that kind of thing. And it might be easier than, uh, you know, going cell by cell and looking at the formula bar. Uh, it might be easier to see it in the spreadsheet and see all of them together. You know, and you notice when you hit that button, it didn't just turn on the formulas for, you know, whatever you selected, but for the whole sheet. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, so, you know, you can uh, print stuff, and you know what, you can actually print uh, the formulas if you wish, and I, I don't really consider that very important. Um, and, you know, they have this little area here, and, you know, if you want to set print areas, for example, um, you can do that. So you don't have to print everything that's on the sheet. Um, and sometimes that's pretty pertinent, you know, because maybe you have stuff on the sheet you don't want to show people. Uh, but you just highlight the range and then you can just print whatever range you want and output it to a different format often. All right, so I'm not really too worried about the print stuff um, in some of these things. Uh, or, and I'm not also too worried about templates, but we should talk about them real briefly. Sometimes you are given, uh, you know, in some circumstances, an Excel file that's a template. And, and what that means is, it's a standard Excel spreadsheet that was set up with information, but when you have the sheet in your hands, you only have the capability to change the contents of specific areas of the spreadsheet. Um, or uh, you're using it as a blueprint to create other 
aspects of a spreadsheet that follows the same format. And uh, this is very common, and if you've ever filled one out, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is often happens with uh, PDFs and Word documents too, where people will give you a template form where you can just change certain entries and not others. Uh, this is not something we're gonna toy with too much. This is really more of a data capture and entry thing than it is um, you know, working with data on high level, which is really our goal. Um, finally, um, you know, whenever you are working uh, with a document, uh, they do also have what we call the info area. And the info area really, and I'm just going to zoom in on this a little bit so you can see what it contains. And, uh, and I'm going to give you kind of an interesting tidbit on this too. So any document that you are working with, um, in uh, Microsoft Office, by the way, so this goes across all the Office products, when you create and save the file, embedded into the file, along with the stuff that's actually in the visible part of the document, you know, the rows and the columns, are, is, a, is a host of metadata that, that follows the file wherever it goes. And that will be displayed in the info screen and as demonstrated here. So it gives you some of the basic info. Uh, the size, the title, any tags if you included them, comments if you want to add them, etc. And then, um, more importantly, who the author is and uh, when it was last modified. And, and, and what's really fascinating about this, you know, and, and you know, when I was uh, first, uh, you know, let's say new to teaching, for example, um, I would sometimes get homework from people. And, um, you know, the, hypothetically, they create their own documents. And then they don't realize that if they're trying to cheat, right, so you take somebody else's Word file or Excel file, um, that, you know, the original author and date of creation is always embedded into the document. And a lot of people are not aware of that. Uh, and there's significantly more uh, properties uh, than people think. And notice that you can actually come in here and change them. So if you actually want to provide a title, you could do that. I could put in my own tags, which helps it easier to search and find it in a file folder, by the way. Or comments like, um, you know, like this doesn't <laughs> really matter or whatever. Um, and that will get saved into the file. Um, but some of the things you cannot actually control is the author information um, and who last modified it. So like if it's a shared document um, and more than one person can edit it, it will show you who last modified it. Uh, and in fact, there's also tools built in that will show you exactly which modifications they made along the way. And um, like I said, this is one where, you know, it, it didn't happen very often, but in a few occasions where people tried to cheat and I would open it and I had suspicions and I would go here and look and, and of course, nobody is aware that the metadata is attached. Interestingly, a lot of the files that we create in most of the programs that we use, um, will often have metadata attached, you know, so for example, if you take a picture on your phone, you know, and you upload it to like a social media site, did you know that the metadata from that follows, you know, a lot of people do know that. Um, but there's also tools out there, by the way, that allow you to uh, edit or remove the metadata. Um, and I, I really don't have any issues with um, necessarily uh, thinking you guys are going to be cheating or anything like that, but it's just kind of interesting. Uh, to know. And yes, I am closing Excel right now because you guys can see that I did make it all the way to the bottom of the of the PowerPoint. I'm surprised actually. We got through it pretty quick. We covered a lot of really important concepts. I am going to stop the video recording here right now, um, but we do have a few moments if you have questions. So this video ends here, folks.